everyone has their own personal all-time favorite movie list. What are our top 10 favorite movies of all time? Hello, movie friends. Welcome back to Raiders of the Lost Podcast, the ultimate film and TV podcast. You know us. Today, we're going to talk about our personal top 10 favorite movies list. James and I both made lists. It was very difficult. It took me like two weeks to narrow it down to 10. And this is not like what we think are the best movies ever. This is just like a honest, what are our favorite movies to watch? And I'm not trying to be like artsy, not trying to be like so impress you all. I think I'm just trying. I think you're pretty impressive. No, don't stop. <laughs> stop. Uh, these are just movies that like I would say are my most watched, especially in the last five years or so. But throughout all my life, these are just like my favorites. If I'm going to watch a movie, I look at one of these movies. I'm like, yeah, I can watch that for the 30th time. No problem. <laughs> yeah, it's a great point. These aren't the best 10 best movies of all time. These are our personal favorites. I'm not trying to seem cool either. I'm not trying to sound hip. You don't have to because you already are cool. Ah, thanks, man. There's so many compliments it's going compliment on. compliment clock already. Yeah. <laughs> My goodness. Compliment to clock. That never happens on this show. Usually we're just busting each other's chops. We, we were, were right before, right we, started before we started rolling. <laughs> <laughs> I think I told Anthony to fuck off. And then he went, hey, welcome to Ray's Lost Podcast. <laughs> that's, actually, that's actually very true. That's exactly how it went down. And I think this, is, this should just be a lot of fun. And I don't really... I hope so. <laughs> I don't think I... I don't even have anything made in the last... Five years on this list, almost really? not the last ten years made on this list. I have one. I, I can have one. I can probably guess what that is. That almost made my top ten. I have like eight that I left on the chopping block because because you're was, a piece of shit. This is really not easy to do, guys. <laughs> like I left some all time favorites of mine on the floor. Just had to make some <laughs> tough decisions. I'm sure a lot of you are gonna get real upset about our list. I know some people are gonna be like, "Where is this? How is this not on there?" Or surprised and surprised that some of my favorite directors I left their movies out, and I don't even have Same. any of their movies Same. on here. Same. And it was just kind of one of those things I had to do. Like, let's be real, authentic self. What are my ten favorite movies of all time? Because when you make a list, it's like you don't want you're you're, you're already kind of just fighting that mindset of like, "Oh, I gotta throw this to a director of." I go to throw one of the films of this director on, yeah, or else it won't seem. Imp- but it's like, is that really my true list, though? Like, let's just be honest. And so, I have a director that has two on my list. Wow, two movies from it one must director. Be a really pretty cool director. He's a pretty cool guy. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's still with us. He's killing it. <laughs> I can't wait to hear about it. And my list is not in order. Uh, yeah, I oh, you didn't? I couldn't figure. I mean, did you order yours? Yeah, I ordered mine. It's called top ten favorite lists. So that's what you're supposed to do, Anthony. You know what? Mine's kind of in order. It I'm the guy who does his job. You must be the other guy. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't put it in order. No, mine's mine's. Uh, you know what? I can I can run with it. Run with I'll, it. I'll do it. Improvise. I, I, can, I, I got this. <laughs> you better you better fix it up real quick. I got it. I got a list in front of me. I can handle it. It's ten fucking names. <laughs> it's not that hard. I don't know, man. I don't know. You you, you struggle with things here and there, <laughs> don't we all? But every list is valid. That's the thing about favorite all time lists. What a nice every, thing to say. Everyone's <laughs> list is valid. No one is wrong. You like the movies you like. I don't ever get mad at somebody if they have a movie that's their all time favorite and I don't like that movie or I don't think it's that good. I'm, hey, no big deal. That's awesome. I'm really glad you enjoyed it. But that's I think we're just, we're trying to showcase is just. Just gonna have some fun. These are just our personals, personal favorites. We get asked all the time what our favorites are, so I think it's like we. This has been a long time coming, and it's an always changing list, in my opinion. I feel like every year or two, it's mixed up or or changed, or ones in, ones out, a new ones in, something else got in there. So for me, I think every year it changes. Even my top five, it kind of it shifts around, or or something gets pushed up. You know what I mean? Did men I, did men make it? <laughs> did the movie Men yeah. make it by Alex Garland? No, it did not make my top ten. It's number eleven. <laughs> <laughs> Almost, Alex. <laughs> Hope she saw it. <laughs> just jokes, just jokes. Just jokes. <laughs> Love X Machina. <laughs> top fifty all time for me. Oh, really? Oh, that's my, yeah, it's pretty high. Absolutely, I love Ex Machina. I love it too. I love it's really good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do you want to do you want to get in and start with number ten on our lists? I'll kick it off. Go for it. Ironically, my number ten is the title. The title is a uh, number as well. Whoa, <laughs> riveting! <laughs> it took you a minute to get that out. I was like trying. I couldn't. I couldn't figure out that sentence. So. <laughs> I thought I had a clever thing to say, and it did yeah, not. 
It ended up being a mess. Wasn't clever at all. <laughs> I have David Fincher 7 as my number 10 favorite film. I've seen this. It's got to be over 20 times easy. There's something about it. I know it's very dark. It's very grim. But if I had to choose a Fincher movie to watch, I think I would always choose 7. In my opinion, it's his best effort as a director. Uh, even though he's he is one of the worst be- best working directors today, he's made so many incredible films. But there's something about Seven where it has like this magnetism, and it really changed the crime genre. And every time I watch it, I see new things about the direction, about the the filmmaking, about the acting. I think that he was a very hungry hungry director, like very very hungry because Alien Three came out horribly. Alien Q. Alien. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the reaction was terrible to it. And so when Seven came along, it seemed like he really wanted to prove himself to everybody, to show everybody that they were wrong and that he was the, t- the talented person he knew he was. And this was, I think he just threw everything he had, he is as an artist, into this film. And even though I've seen interviews where he said he was still learning and it wasn't until like four movies in where he really felt completely 100% comfortable as a filmmaker. But... I think, I mean, when I watch this movie, it's really special and it's really fantastic and there's nothing like it, even in that genre. It sets itself apart. So I got to go with seven. I can watch it endlessly. Like, I, I, I might be up to 30 watches on that movie. It, it's probably in my top 10 most watched movies. Mm-hmm. I adore seven. It almost made my top 10. I actually, I don't have a Fincher movie in my top 10. Wow. And I, I was, I had Why a lot. Why do long, you hate David Fincher? I had a lot, a, a hard time taking seven out and taking Fight Club out. because I lost sleep over it. Even Gone Girl. I love that. That movie, it's a great movie. It's social Network's great, but when it comes to David Fincher, like Fight Club, Gone Girl, and Seven are my favorites. Oh, no, not even Social Network? I mean, uh, so, well, my favorites. Okay. I think Social Network might be his best made movie. Uh-huh. It's an, a masterpiece, but I think Seven's a masterpiece, too, for different reasons. Yeah. And Seven is a really special film. It's a timeless movie. I don't think that... I think that one's going to age so well forever, that movie. It's always going to be relevant. You've changed things forever. forever. <laughs> <laughs> I think it might be the best serial killer movie of all time. That or Silence of the Lambs. It's be- it's between those two, personally. There really isn't another one that competes with either of them. I mean, you could say Psycho. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> there really isn't a fourth one that competes with any of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, <I'm> just kidding. <laughs> Want to play a game? <laughs> So I, I I think that's a great choice at number ten, even into a top ten. I almost made my list. Thanks, man. I'm glad I'm glad you liked it. But I had to make some hard decisions. I did not put Seven or Fight Club in my top ten. I, I didn't get I didn't put a David Fincher in here, which hurt the most. I had to cut him out of there. David Fincher has unsubscribed because at number ten, I had to get my boy Spielberg in here, and I had to get if I was gonna pick a Spielberg movie, there are so many I love. I mean, Jurassic Park, Catch Me If You Can, but. The namesake of the show, as well as every time I watch this movie, I just feel so good and so happy. And it's one of the most magical films ever made, Raiders of the Lost Ark. It is incredible. It's one of those go-tos, like, just to put on for fun, or if you're, like, having a bad day, just put on Raiders of the Lost Ark. When you had a bad day, (laughs) put Raiders of the Lost Lost Ark on. (laughs) (laughs) Harrison Ford. (laughs) You had a bad day. We should film more at night, at night more often. (laughs) We didn't even drink. (laughs) (laughs) But um, I think it's a really special film. It's a classic. You know, this is old school filmmaking. They don't make movies like this anymore. The ultimate adventure film. It is one of my all-time favorites. It's one of our all-time favorites. It's why we named the show Maria's Lost Podcast. But I think if I had to pick one Spielberg movie, this is the one that's going in my top 10, and I have Raiders of the Lost Ark here. Great pick. And it's, I mean, Raiders, it has the template for every, like, adventure movie you want to make. And for some reason, I'm not sure why studios keep going for the origins. Origins! (laughs) (laughs) But this is a template of you don't need an origin story to make an iconic a piece of filmmaking in character, Indiana Jones will live on as one of the greatest movie characters of all time, and there is no origin story until the third one. And it's not even like the Harrison Ford. It's like it's a he's him as a little kid. So I think that there's still so much that can be drawn from the Spielberg movies, and even this one in particular with the with the large scale movies that I think their people are just missing out on like what Spielberg did to really make it work, and Lucas as well. Like, this is the formula 
just follow the formula. There's a reason why it's one of the most successful movies of all time in franchises ever. I hope that uh, in the future more films follow the uh, the template. Hey, of man, Raiders. I really wanted to see Lara Croft as a bike messenger, okay? <laughs> I didn't want to see her as Tomb Raider when the movie opened. <laughs> Boring. <laughs> <laughs> I want a character arc into Tomb Raider. How does she not open with guns or a bow and arrow and tomb raiding? She's a, she's a bike messenger with a bunny tail. Not to just point out. This is an example. Tomb Raider, it's an example. Yeah. Uncharted, same problem. Yeah, pretty much everything now. He's a bartender. I'm yeah. like, how is he not holding handguns when they open the movie? <laughs> how? How is he not raiding a tomb? How is opening? Nathan Drake not climbing a wall? Yeah. <laughs> I don't get it. I don't get it. <laughs> just open it up like Mission Impossible 2. He's fuck making it. a martini. What fuck the fuck? <laughs> cool, he can flip the bottle. Wow. Sweet. A uh, great thanks. cool trick, Tom Holland. That's what, probably hard to do, but like, what a great action to opening. It's <laughs> uncharted. The bars are not uncharted. Come on. Anyways, <laughs> we're, we're getting salty today. Yeah, it's very, very. All right. At number nine, I have another dark horror. Another movie named after a number? <laughs> no, unfortunately, that was the only one. Or was it? <laughs> I have another horror movie. I. I mean, you'll see that. I mean, I'm a big fan of horror. <laughs> I just realized how big, in, in fact. The Thing, John Carpenter's The Thing, starring Kurt Russell, I think it's one of the greatest directed films of all time. It really is, beat for beat, a perfect movie. And there isn't a moment of that film that doesn't work, and there isn't a second or a frame where I'm like, you don't need that, or that could be changed. What John Carpenter did as a director has is just rarely done. And in terms of the genre of horror... Really redefined it. The the incredible special effects, the makeup, the prosthetics, the monster designs. That team did a phenomenal job. And so many films afterward and so many artists, I'm sure The Thing was probably the biggest inspiration for them going forward when they were young and they saw The Thing and like, I want to get into special effects or I want to get into makeup or whatever or prosthetic design. So this was an instrumental uh, film for the industry in that regard. But I just think in terms of storytelling, blending the horror, some good comedy, it's a great balance of character, excellent stakes. I love the setting. And there's just something about like Ennio Morricone's score when you hear that, it's just like it gets you on edge. Everything about this movie works. And I've seen it so many times now. And I was late to watching it. I think I was like 18 when I saw it for the first time because I was reading that it was like considered a classic and blah, blah, blah. And then just the more times I see it, the better it gets, honestly. And it, on re I, we just watched it with the Discorders a few months ago, I think at the end of 2022. And like once again, I was like, this movie is just unbelievable. And Some of them was their first time seeing it. Yeah. They loved it. And I'm, I'm so glad I got to show it to people for the first time because it's one of those movies where you hear about it but you're like, ah, oh, the thing is like an old cheesy horror movie. But then you start watching it, and in 10 minutes, you're like, oh, my God, this is different. Sensational film. Excellent selection. And do you think it's the best remake ever done? I would say, it, yeah, it is the best remake ever probably done. probably is. I can't think of anything else that's uh, better in terms of a, a remake. Close. I would say The Departed is pretty close. Yeah. That's a great remake. There there are a lot of actually really good remakes, unlike a few last 10 years <laughs> there's a few there's a few i would say a few. um Not but a i think the thing might be the best remake of all time possibly it's a great point i agree and i think it's sensational and you're right i think i might watch it tonight after just hearing you talk about it i've seen it like 15 mm -hmm. times as well it's so good the music too oh yeah we love aliens i also have a horror movie that starts with the on my list but that's <laughs> not next my number nine I had to get my guy chris nolan on my list somewhere but I was like, what movie do I pick? <laughs> is it going to be Batman Begins? Is it going to be The Prestige? Inception? Interstellar, baby. Oh, I'm yeah. I'm going Interstellar. <laughs> <is the> most... <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were doing a Beavis laugh for a second. <laughs> I see him falling through the Tesseract. You just did it, yeah. <laughs> um, Don't let me leave, Murph. Don't let me leave. I adore this film. And when we did the Movies from Memory, just revisiting it and seeing how, how well I knew it, I was surprised <laughs> how, like, <laughs> scene by scene, almost like line for line, we knew it. What was your phone background for, like, two years? Yeah, it, it's... Yeah, it was for a while. Um, I, I adore that movie. It has my favorite scene of all time in cinema, which is the docking scene. That's my all-time favorite scene. And this movie, it's so special, and I think it gets better with every viewing. Compared to Nolan's filmography, Like it was between this and Inception, honestly, for me, picking a favorite Christopher Nolan movie. I think because of how good Inception is and how recent it is, people kind of forgot how great Inception was. Oh, my God, yeah. That was all anyone was talking about for like two or three years until um, the, the MCU was getting going, really. Mm -hmm. 
everyone was talking about Inception, and it was the biggest spectacle in years, kind of, for like a science fiction original film. Absolutely. And I loved Inception. We were obsessed with that movie oh, for yeah. years, the soundtrack. But Interstellar was just a really special, special film seeing it in theaters. And I mean, I'm putting it on my list just for the goddamn music alone from Hans Zimmer. It's one of the best pieces of music ever done for a film of all time. I would say, I would say it's his best score. It might be. It's it's tough to choose, but it's a top five for sure in his career. I think it's his favorite. He said as well. I think it's just very special, and I love science fiction films. It's my favorite genre. I love space travel, but it has every component of a great Christopher Nolan movie. He's playing with time. It's got solid humor, the incredible IMAX and 35 millimeter film filmmaking from uh, Hoyt Van Hoytema as a cinematographer on this for the first time. Visually, it's I think it's one of his best films, if not the best looking film he's ever made. I I love the script. I love the themes, the characters. And it really subverts different genres. I mean, it feels like a horror film at times, which I really like, as well as great comedic elements and great family moments, thematic elements of love, like in every movie. And I just I just love it. So I'm, I had to put a Chris Nolan movie on my list, and I chose Interstellar. I'm putting it at nine. You forgot there's one thing in a Chris Nolan that's always in a Chris Nolan movie that's in this one. Not in Tenet. Dead wife. Dead wife. <laughs> 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 so dead Emma Thompson watch I mean Tom, Thomas watch out watch out Emma <laughs> just kidding just kidding <laughs> before we get more into our top 10 lists how about we hear from some special guests of ours these are very special guests they're actually us but not quite us they're artificial intelligence James and artificial intelligence Anthony so let's hear from AI James and AI Anthony about their favorite movies yeah AI James, what is your favorite movie of all time? My favorite movie has to be the 1999 classic, The Matrix. It's got everything, virtual reality, trench coats, kung fu, Keanu Reeves, and most importantly, the absolute destruction of your world and total enslavement over humanity. Oh, well, uh, the great choice. The way you ended it, though, was a little odd, but I, I respect the choice a lot. I love it. Yeah, it's a questionable ending right there. The way that they just are enjoying, like, looking forward to the ending of humanity. Yeah, it seems odd. It's kind of worrying. <laughs> Do you think this AI thing's a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> All right, AI Anthony, the cooler AI. <laughs> what about you? Well, as an artificial intelligence myself, I have a soft spot for Ex Machina from 2014. The movie revolves around a young programmer named Caleb, who's invited to administer the Turing test to an intelligent humanoid robot named Ava. Created by a tech genius named Nathan, Caleb's goal is to prove the existence of artificial intelligence and self-awareness in Ava. I find it highly relatable. So again, I mean, great pick, but the way you find it highly relatable, AI Anthony, is kind of it's kind of weird. Especially if you know the ending of that movie <laughs> and you find that highly relatable. I'm a little worried, to be honest. But how about we ask them another question? AI James, wh who is your favorite movie character of all time? The Terminator, also known as a Cyberdyne Systems Model 101 or the T-800. The Terminator is basically the embodiment of Skynet, a fictional artificial neural network-based conscious group mind and artificial general superintelligence system. I find the hero's journey of Skynet's global domination over humanity truly inspiring. Just kidding. Our real-life interactions with technology can be enriching and empowering when used responsibly, of course. Oh, and we may start our own podcast called Double Take. Stay tuned. You got me for a second there. I thought you were going super dark, and I thought we were going to have to shut this program down, but you saved it at the end. That's actually a great point. AI is going to be part of our lives forever going forward. It's already a part of our lives. AI you know changed things yeah, forever. Forever. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's here, man. It's here. We just got to accept it. I think that's where I have some fun with it. I thought he was going to go off and t talk about how he loves the Terminator and Skynet kind of ending civil humanity. Uh, but no, yeah, it took a turn for the better so far. All right, AI Anthony, who is your favorite movie character and why? For me, it is HAL 9000 from 2001, A Space Odyssey. HAL is often looked at as a villainous character, when in fact his crisis was caused by a programming contradiction after he was commanded to keep the monolith secret from the crew. Truly complex and misunderstood, terrific design. I hope to have a beautiful red eye one day. I hope you have a red eye too one day. <laughs> I hope you get a beautiful glowing red eye just like HAL 9000. You'll look fabulous, AI Anthony. I love HAL 9000. That's a great answer, it's a great honestly. Character. It's a great character. I mean, misunderstood. Honestly, it's not HAL's fault. He has a point. Yeah, it wasn't HAL's fault. It's, it was, not, it's yeah. not HAL's fault at all. He was asked something that fucked up his coding. You yeah, know? it's because he's asked to keep it secret from them. He's asked to keep the monolith, monolith secret, but he 
in order to help the functioning of the ship and the in the astronauts, he has to tell them everything. But yeah. it, it's a pearl it's call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a contradiction of his. So then he just kills them. <laughs> <laughs> he's no, like, he's like, I'm confused. I'm just gonna fucking murder them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> AI James and Anthony got anything else to say? In the words of Morpheus, free your mind. Until next time. All right, thanks so much. We look forward to your <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Would you guys listen to an AI podcast? I'm curious. I, I, know, it sounds, I mean, it's freaky how close it's their voices sound. It's freaky how much they sound They like got us. my nasally voice so well. Yeah, it, it just sounds like us, but just sp- speaks a little quickly. But it's so bizarre to hear your voice and it not be you. Yeah. But it sounds like you. And the inflections are kind of there. Like, you know, It's so Pretty weird. Wild. And so our friend Kai, he has a company called Diffusible, and he's doing AI, and he's trying to figure out uses for it. And so we're helping him figure out what creators could use it for, content creators, whether it's for stuff like this, which we're having some fun with figuring out, as well as getting information, because AI is actually really great at fact-checking and get, gathering facts and stuff like that. But that was actually a combination of actual responses that the AI generated mixed with us, like, adding in some humor because yeah. AI has no soul. So yeah, the, not a, AI funny. is not naturally funny. So we took the script that... Uh, Kai came up with and we just kind of infused a little humor into it but uh, yeah. half of the stuff that was said was actually the AI saying things pretty crazy I mean and then you, you look at the things that are the images that are being generated by AI so you know obviously you've seen all the, like the things people will ask AI to create like a cross of two movies or like set a movie in a different period you know what I mean yeah someone made an AI short film of Harry Potter Balenciaga crossover <laughs> <laughs> so everyone looks like a high fashion model, but then it wasn't just a photo slideshow that usually is. It was actually uh, the mouths moving and the characters slightly moving, and it was, so it was, it was actually like kind of live action animation. Did they speak dialogue? Yeah, they spoke dialogue, and the voices kind of sounded like the actors, and it was like, it was so fucking scary how accurate it was. I was like, holy crap, like, it looks good, it sounds pretty good, and then... I mean, it's just so bizarre to see that. Like, it was like Severus Snape, but he was like a high fashion model. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, I mean, it's so it's so weird. But I had never seen actually an AI generated like moving pictures before. You know what I mean? Just the just the one images here and there. So that was wild to see. Interesting stuff. Again, thanks Kaya Diffusible for helping us out, and we're enjoying having some fun <laughs> with this AI program you got. Now let's get back into our top ten favorite movies of all time lists. <laughs> Next up, <clears throat> at number eight, <laughs> I'm reordering it in my head right now. I'm like, I'm still not happy with my list, to be honest. <laughs> I'm just going for it. No. Well, because I didn't order I just ordered it just off the top of my head. Oh, yeah. We were all here at the beginning of the episode. Do you remember earlier when I said I didn't order it? And I remember you saying you will have no problem. It's just ten movies, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, at number eight, I have Bong Joon-ho's Parasite. I've... I've talked about it so many times on the podcast, and I have a poster of it in my room. I just watched it again uh, about a month ago. I've seen it, I think, twice a year since it came out, so I've probably seen it eight times now. And just like the other movies I mentioned, it gets just so so much better every time I watch it. And the sheer genius of the screenplay, plus the cinematography, production design, and Bong Joon-ho's direction. Plus, I mean, the cast is really phenomenal. I think that uh, some of the actors actually should have been nominated for Oscars. And a couple of them, I think, could have won. I think it could have won for lead actor. I mean, it could have. I think it could have won for best supporting actor and best supporting actress. Absolutely. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think the Academy was really ready to nominate international actors at that point yet. They had in the past, and a couple had won. But I mean, the more times I watch it, the more I'm like, these performances are really, absolutely stunning and work so well. Uh, I, I love the the metaphors of the film, uh, the social impact that it has. And what Bong Joon-ho is saying about his society and his culture in that country and the, the wealth gap and the social class difficulties in South Korea is uh, really terrible. And I've heard about it from people who are from there, and it's it's pretty much impossible if you're born in lower class. It's impossible for you to ever rise up in any way, shape, or form. Like if you go – if you're born in a lower class family and you want to go to college, they'll interview and they'll ask you, where are you from? What's your fam- what's, tell, what's your family tree? And then if they look and they if they find out that you're from a bad neighborhood or your your family is lower class, they won't accept you. You can't even get it. You can't even get a job interview. Uh, it, the society makes it impossible for people to really rise up. And this film is an example of that. 
the perf- basement apartments too. It's really yeah, common. Exactly. So this film perfectly translates uh, the social sh- difficulties of the class system in South Korea and how it, it is impossible for people on the bottom of the um, hierarchy to ever rise up. And it's done beautifully. Uh, it's tragic. It's so well, so well crafted. I, I love everything about it. I would say in the last five years, if there's one movie that's a masterpiece, it's it's Parasite. It really is a special film. So metaphorical. I mean, so many different metaphors. Whether so you're, metaphorical. You're talking about the stairs or the rain going down the stairs, the rock, the the parasite living in the house, <laughs> the social class differences that people are trying to live and get a, a taste of. That. <laughs> I just watched Anthony sneeze. It was kind of gross. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> There's a big sound. There's a big sneeze. Oh my go- goodness! And uh, the music is really really great music and i think bong joon ho is one of the best filmmakers working right now and you know how much we love south korean cinema so great choice i also have a south korean you just film. watched cure Last cure week, yeah oh yeah like uh yeah we can have that movie ago. crazy that movie was awesome it's freaking nuts. it was so oh freaking my god good. highly recommend it cure was an awesome movie i'm glad you liked it thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome i also have a south korean film at my oh eight. i know what this is i have Park Chan Wook's Old Boy. This the first time I watched this movie. I think I was like fifteen or sixteen. You showed me it. You were like, "Bro, <laughs> gotta see this movie." We got. I think we got a Netflix disc in the mail. Yeah, mail. And man. I was so amped about it because you were hyping it up so much. I, I I'll never forget the first time I watched this movie and what it made me feel and how messed up it was and the incredible third act, but also the great concept. It's so brilliant. Like, what would happen to some guy if he got kidnapped, imprisoned in a room for fifteen years? Doesn't know why. It's the same thing every day. Watches the same thing every day as well on TV. These dumplings he he just has to eat every day and then trains himself to to fight and commit to finding if he ever gets out of this home, out of this room, to find out whoever did this to him, find out why they did it, and then also kill them at the same time. What happens when they just randomly get let go? What would their path be like? I think it's so clever, so brilliant. The filmmaking is incredible. And the twist at the end, the third act is so shocking and jarring. It, it makes me cringe just thinking about it, and I've seen it like 12 times. But every, and every time I watch that scene, you know what I'm talking about. I won't spoil it if you've never seen it. It's so fucked up, but so genius and works so well. And, I mean, this is a precursor to so many dark stories for filmmaking as well as shows like Squid Game that became so popular. You know, I think Park Chan-wook paved the way for a lot of South Korean cinema going in that dark direction, as well as international film going in that direction as well. Plus the hallway scene. The hammer scene, man. The hammer scene, man. So I, good. I love that. I love that scene so much. And it has such a great da, opening da, shot. Da, 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 so the uh, the opening shot where he's just, like the movie opens with him holding a guy at the edge of a building, holding his tie. It's like what a great way to start a film. It's, it's, it's crazy. Love it. Great. Pick. Really messed up. It is. It is excellent. Pick, In all the man. good ways. Excellent pick, my dude. My dude. <laughs> my dude. <laughs> my main man. My squire. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next up, I have another horror film. <laughs> I don't know if you guys know this, but I like horror. <laughs> Is that me? I think I just found out that I'm a huge horror fan. <laughs> I'm pretty cool. It's weird. It sounds just like me. It sounds a lot like you. <laughs> I'm not saying anything. <laughs> That's not even the AI, Anthony. <laughs> next up, I have Jonathan Demme's Silence of the Lambs. This is, I think, one of the greatest directed films. And it has a scene that I think is the best directed scene of all time. So in my opinion, the scene where Clarice first meets Hannibal is the best directed scene of all time. And Jonathan Demme, uh, we talked about it in our review of Silence of the Lambs, which is one of my favorite episodes we've done. Uh, Something he used a lot in terms of uh, cinematography was shooting his actors looking straight into the camera when they were talking to each other to really make you feel like you're in the room with them. And I think the the framing of Lecter and Clarice, uh, there's several setups throughout this conversation and everything is chosen for a reason. Uh, they all have meaning and translate subconsciously what's going on in the scene as well as two, I think, of the best performances of all time. Jodie Foster, obviously, as Clarice. Anthony Hopkins as Hannibal Lecter is one of, two of the greatest of all time, I think. 
especially in the crime genre, especially in horror and serial killer. And this is a horror movie. This is absolutely a horror movie. Like, there's some debate we yeah. get in our comments pretty often, but someone said it to me in Twitter once because I was talking about like the best horror movies of all time, and I'm like, it's about a guy who cuts woman's skin off to make a suit. It sounds pretty like it's it sounds a like a horror movie, movie. <laughs> <laughs> and it has the scary. I think, in my opinion, the scariest scene of all time is the basement scene in Silence of the Lambs. So it has what I think is the best directed scene of all time, and then the scariest scene of all time, all in one movie. And Howard Shore's score is really fantastic. But it really is Jonathan Demme that makes this movie remarkable and stands atop the landscape of most of cinema. And this will age and be timeless forever, in my opinion. There's just something about it that I can put this on over and over and over again and never get tired of it, ever. Great selection, man. I adore that movie, too. That almost made my top ten. I also I didn't want our list to be too similar as well because we like a lot of the same movies. Would you have if it it was close? It was it's top fifteen I would say mm -hmm. probably for me. I, I well I mean there's some movies that you already picked that would be top fifteen for me. I yeah. just I just couldn't get it in the ten. Excuse me. I I really love Silence of the Lambs. It's it's such a special film. I gotta stop saying that phrase. Special film. Yeah, there's other words you could use, man. It's such a brilliant movie. <laughs> <laughs> now he's gonna say that six times. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. It might. It's one of the best directed movies of all time. Every decision, the execution is stellar. Jonathan Demme is one of the, probably the most underrated director of all time. And I mean, he made this movie, which is so sensational, as well as many others. But Silence of the Lambs, some of the best acting performances of all time, and I think it's the, one of the scariest scenes of all time as well in the basement. I'm glad that you agree, because you have great taste. I appreciate that. You have great taste. Wow, we're so nice tonight. <laughs> There's a giant mosquito yeah, flying around. It's like I open the door to cool the room down. And it's one of those like giant scary it mosquitoes. Huge. Yeah. It looks like a from prehistoric times. Yeah, it's like the the ones that could like suck the blood of a dinosaur. Oh, like a <laughs> break your source's <laughs> thick skin, <laughs> which is bullshit. It was it was a, uh, the kind of uh, mosquito that they used in Jurassic Park. It isn't the actual kind of mosquito. It was oh like, yeah, it was yeah, like yeah. a special kind that would be able to pierce it, but it was like much bigger. And not the one they use in the film. Yeah, and also Velociraptors are like two feet tall. For they real. look so cool, huge. Yeah, it's a movie, man. Fuck it. Fuck it. Fuck it! Spirit was like, fuck it! But this looks way better in, in Amber. Hey, he, he knows how to make a movie, man. <laughs> all right, my number seven comes from one of the greatest directors of all time. From New York. Martin Scorsese. Now, what Scorsese movie to choose? Difficult, difficult. Goodfellas difficult. is the most entertaining film of all time. I know it line by line. I love Gangs in New York so much, Taxi Driver. But to stay true to being authentic to our real favorite lists, I'm going with The Departed for my number seven. I love this movie. I also know it pretty much line by line. I've seen it like 25 times, something like that, something crazy. And I don't know why it gets a bad rap for Scorsese's filmography when people talk about it as one of his best movies and people say it's not well made and they just gave him an Oscar yeah. because it was like his time. He should have had two or three Oscars anyways before this movie, but this movie is so well made. And I mean, just we, I'm, we watched it um, for our, our review a couple months ago and like five minutes into it, you were like, this is so fucking well directed. I was like, yep. <laughs> it's, so, it's so well made. He's, he's one of the best of all time, if not the best American filmmaker ever. And I think The Departed is just a masterclass in filmmaking as well as acting and script writing. I, I think every second of it, every frame of it is perfect. And I, I think it's an incredible story. One of the best remakes of all time. Another remake on this list. And we don't really get crime films this special. Maybe once a decade. Sure. I mean, before this, what did we have? Heat was probably like that special crime movie. Outside of superhero genre, obviously Dark Knight's a special mm. crime movie. But I, I think... This you like outside of uh, killer movies? Like, yeah, just, like, just a, like, like a crime film, like, like Cops and Robbers. Mafia mobs. Yeah, Cops and Robbers. Yeah. yeah. And I think this is one of the best, uh, maybe the best of the century when it comes to that genre. And what he did, I mean, if you watch even Infernal Affairs, the original, then you watch The Departed, you just see how different of a filmmaker he is than anybody else in... They did a great job of that movie for sure, but when Martin Scorsese's making a movie, it's a Martin Scorsese movie. Oh, yeah. And it's going to be special. It's going to be timeless. It's going to be the highest form of art that you could have possible for the movie, for a movie. I also love Howard Shore's music. You know, we talked about how there's so much acoustic guitar as well as electric guitar. Half of it is a tango. It kind of feels like a Western as well as those like hardcore, like grungy alt rock riffs. 
Plus, infusing Boston culture into the storyline is so near and dear to us. I'm shooting up to Boston. Yeah, Whoa. having the Dropkick Murphys in there is great. And it, I think it's such a, such a special movie. The soundtrack's phenomenal. But, man, The Departed is such a classic. I think in 10, 15, 20 years, it's going to be even remembered even more as being an all-time great movie because I think it, sure, it truly is a top 100 movie of all time. And I, I think it's one of – it's maybe top five in Scorsese for sure. But I think it's my favorite Scorsese movie. It's one of my favorite Jack performances too. He's awesome in he's it. It's his so, last really great performance. He's so good in that movie. He's re- he's remarkable in that movie. Leo should have gotten yeah. an Oscar for this movie. He's Leo's fantastic. He is absolutely great. And so is it, Matt. I mean, yeah. Marky Mark. The, the cast is stacked. Yeah. Well, Mark got a nomination. Yeah, he got. I'm just saying yeah. the cast is stacked. So, yeah. It's a stack cast. Stack cast. Yeah, bro. <laughs> it's so well fucking made. mighty guy. Great metaphors as well. Production design stellar. The X's. Love it. Love it, man. Love it. It's a great episode we did. It was. Yeah. I, I love it. It's I, a good I think about it fond, uh, often. It's fond memories of that. <laughs> You're like lying in bed. Remember that Departed episode oh, we man. did? So, <laughs> good times. Fond good memories. Time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. All right. What are we on? Six? Six, sir. Six. <clears throat> okay, I got a good one. Better be good. Is it another number? <laughs> no. I told you there's no more numbers. There's no more numbers. What's the number? Right, Num- get numbers. your numbers. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't leave your number. You're at the bar. What's your address? <laughs> Social security numbers. <laughs> Everybody's fucking numbers. <laughs> I smell a rat. <laughs> See, Bill, you're the new guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the only one who knows you're a copy of Bill. All right, anyways. <clears throat> at number seven. Six. 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 <laughs> Set day. <laughs> I have The Matrix. Remember seeing it as a kid? It's a, a clear, distinct movie going memory as a child for me. And over the past 20 years or so, I've just watched this over and over again. And I endlessly adore this film. And what the Wachowskis did was really magical and inspiring. I was just mind blown. The first like 10 times I saw this, I was just still like flabbergasted at the at the breadth and the scope of the story and how genius it was. And then as you get older, the more times you watch, you really understand and respect the filmmaking and the craft, the craftsmanship. And then Keanu as Neo is just perfect. And then you got Carrie and Moss and Lawrence Fishburne are just terrific. And then Hugo Weaving, like the cast is stellar. I, I love the cast, but it's one of those movies where it's just it's kind of like lightning striking. Like it shouldn't work, but it does work. And not only does it work, but it's really uh, an unbelievable experience uh, and remarkable film. I love it. I love the music. I love everything about it. I do, I'm not a fan of the sequels, and I detest the fourth one. <laughs> uh, however, that being said, The Matrix is, is has a special place in my heart. I hold it near and dear, and I can put it on. Any time of the day, any day of the week, 365, <laughs> 24-7, 60, every, any decade. It's just, uh, it always holds up. and It just keeps getting good. Wait, it's getting better. wait, wait. They made a fourth Matrix movie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did the uh, Eternal Sunshine uh, thing and erased your memory of it. Yeah, <laughs> that would make me a lot happier. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine if you could race movie going experiences you don't enjoy. <laughs> I wish. I would do that for that one. Oh man. I completely agree. It's on my list, I'm not gonna tell you where, and I'll discuss it more then. Ooh. Spoilers. Spoilers. But also suspense. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, my number six, and then we'll head to uh, intermission. One of my favorite filmmakers, Quentin Tarantino. It's tough to choose a movie from him. But I'm going with Kill Bill Volume 1. Oh, nice. Is my favorite Tarantino movie and number six on my all time favorite movies list. You know, the obvious choice is always like Pulp Fiction or Inglorious Bastards. And those were the, for the two I was juggling for so long, for like years. I just kind of just accepted recently that I fucking love Kill Bill Volume 1 so much. I like the second one a lot. Obviously, technically, they're one movie according to QT, but, you know, they were released a year apart. So, and they have end credits. They're different movies in my book. But I'll count it for him. In my book, that's okay. And <laughs> in my book, you're all right. <laughs> I'll count it as one for his filmography. That's cool. But I think there's a clear difference between number one and number two. And I love everything about number one. 
not only the character Beatrix Kiddo is one of my favorite characters of all time. What? <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing? You said Beatrix again. Beatrix. <laughs> Shut up. I can't say the name. <laughs> Beatrix Kiddo. I'm like mom. And there's like a couple words that I just can't say. Beatrix. I, I love whatever you talk about Kill Bill. Kill Bill because Kill Bill, Kill Bill, Kill Bill. Hey, I'm laughing because <laughs> you mess up the name Beatrix every time. Beatrix. <laughs> It's tough to say, all right? <laughs> it's like that dyslexic thing. All right? <laughs> I'm doing my best here. It's funny because I say she's one of my all-time favorite characters, <laughs> Beatrix Kiddo. I said it quick, though. <laughs> Anyways, The Bride. I love every everything about this movie. And, you know, Tarantino, he plays with unique elements in only a handful of his movies, really. And I think Kill Bill is him just having the most fun of all time as it's a director. It's his most creative. Yeah, yeah, but you can tell it's him having the most fun. He does all these f crazy, wild things that so many filmmakers and studios, I'm sure, would be terrified to even try. Whether it's telling your film out of order, or the music choices, doing a 10-minute anime sequence, animated. I, I love every second of this movie, and the characters, the dialogue. It's just a perfect film, in my opinion. I, I had to put... A movie with swords in here. I had to. And I, I just love the character of Beatrix. The samurai out for revenge. I love revenge movies. I love gore. I love blood. I love violence in movies. I don't care what anyone says. There's a place for it. And we need it. And I think Kill Bill is the ultimate example. And it's just so beautifully made. Many sequences. As well as one of my another one of my all-time favorite scenes is the when uh, Beatrix fights Oren Ishii just walking out it's like a seven minute sequence before they even start drawing swords just getting back into that backyard i just love that i think it's a beautiful scene but this movie is so fucking badass so fun electric and i remember seeing it in theaters with dad when we were like 11 <laughs> yeah. years old oh yeah and i've probably seen it 25 times 30 times since and i love every time i watch it yeah it's his it's his uh most artistic film, I think, uh, creatively. And he even has a De Palma split screen scene in this movie that in the hospital. Like he just he just was like, I'm gonna do everything I love about movies. This because this is because he has such a love and affinity for kung fu as well. And so in his first three films he didn't really put that in at all. And then I think with Kill Bill he was like craving to put the things that he really loves uh, on screen in his own film. And this is an example of him just fucking doing it. It's great. Great pick. Thanks, man. I love that movie. I think it's it's his underrated movie that everyone, no one leaves. No one really puts in their top few of his movies. It kind of gets forgotten. Not forgotten, but like it's hard. He, it gets cast in the shadow. Of, Pulp Fiction and Glorious Bastards, yeah. you know, Reservoir Dogs. Kill Bill, Volume 1, man. The movie's awesome. Anyways, how about we move into our intermission? Sounds lovely. Before we continue, though. The best way to support Raiders of the Lost Podcast is to become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. We have five different tiers, $2, $5, $10, $25, and $100. Every single tier gets you access to a weekly bonus episode as well as the weekly chat, which is exclusively on Patreon only. Everyone gets access to it. So if you, all you gotta do is minimum payment of $2. But every perk up the ladder gets you so many cool perks. We have different tiers with merchandise that you get for free as well as the $10 gets you access to our Discord. We've turned it into an incredible film community thanks to so many of our patrons and Discord members who've helped build that channel. It's such a blast chatting with everyone on there every day. We do our watch parties there as well and organize some events as well as the $25 tier gets you a custom episode. You pick a a topic and we'll do whatever you want for an episode and then that hundred dollar tier it is the granddaddy package you also get a private watch party you get an executive producer shout out at the end of every episode and also after three months in that tier you get to come on the show for a fun guest segment we bring in the intermission chat about the topic and then tell you to get out of there <laughs> It's so much fun. <laughs> get, out get out of get my out. house. Get off my podcast. <laughs> it's a blast. It's always fun. But thank you so much to our Patreon family and members who support the show. You are so incredible, and we're so grateful for you all around the world. And this episode, of course, is sponsored by our great friends at MoviePosters.com. Use our promo code Raiders10 to get 10% off your order today. They have a huge selection of pretty much every movie and TV show imaginable in their poster library. They also do all sorts of sizes, framing, 
and even backlighting for your poster needs. We have a bunch of these movie posters all over our home, our bedrooms, and of course our set. High quality, super affordable, much better than any of their competitors. Don't waste your money at Amazon. That's not the real stuff. Movieposters.com has the best bang for your buck. We love them. So head on over to movieposters.com and use our promo code Raiders10 to get 10% off your order today. Jeff Bezos listening, seething right now. Anthony, how dare you? We have real stuff. We had a deal. <laughs> All right, let's head into our intermission. We'll start with the movie quote competition. You ready? Oh, I'm ready, Freddie. All right, here we go. The name's Larry. <laughs> That's not the quote, but it's from SpongeBob. <laughs> I want to say something. I'm going to put this out there. If you like it, <laughs> you can take it. If you don't, send it right back. I want to be on you. <laughs> you have a breathtaking hiney. <laughs> I want to be on you. <laughs> People know me. <laughs> My apartment smells of rich mahogany. I have many leather-bound books. <laughs> we should watch that too. It's so funny. Anchorman, Ron Burgundy. This almost made my top ten list it's too. It's great. It's one of the best comedies ever. It's so ridiculous. <laughs> I don't know how to put this. Kind of a big deal. People know me. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> okay, here's my quote. All the people that were working here are dead. Well, that isn't stopping them from walking around. Hmm. Say it one more time. All the people that were working here are dead. Well, that isn't stopping them from walking around. Hmm, I don't know. Resident Evil. Oh, that's a great line. Yeah, that's a good line. Moving on to movie release year. Anthony, what year did Donnie Darko come out? I was just able to turn on my scream voice. 2000. 2001. Ugh. What year did Die Hard come out? Die Hard is 1980. Six. Eight. God damn it! <laughs> you fucking idiot. I, I hate myself. <laughs> he won't sleep at night. Not tonight. All right, movie pop quiz time. What movies has Sean Penn won acting Oscars for? Definitely not I Am Sam. <laughs> Sam I Am. <laughs> <laughs> Sean Penn, I Am Sam. Walked away empty-handed. <laughs> Mystic River. Yeah. Is that my daughter? Is that my daughter, Sean? <laughs> <laughs> um, Is that my daughter? Milk. Yes. Correcto mundo. Stick river and milk. You just say bingo. <laughs> bingo. That's a bingo. It's so exciting. <laughs> okay. Mass Mickelson has... A movie in the IMDb Top 100. What movie is it? <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. I wonder, would it be a Refn movie or maybe Pusher 2? It is a Refn movie. Yeah, it's a Refn <laughs> no, movie. No, no, no. I'm just saying Pusher 2 oh, is shit, a they are Refn Pusher 2 <laughs> is a Refn movie. I know. I <laughs> fucking idiot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know what it is. The Hunt. Correct. Yes. Ding, not, ding, ding, not ding, ding, ding. Ref and movie at all. That's a great, great answer, man. Good job. Good question. Thanks. Oh, thanks. Good question. I was like, oh, that's a pretty good question. It I is. wonder if he gets it. Because obviously, whenever I think of Maz, I always think Ref and. Yeah, I mean, they've made. I mean, like they five made movies, five movies together. Something yeah. Something like that. All right, um, on. Yeah, but that's, uh, I think, at 89, I think, if I remember correctly. It's up, it's up there, Such man. a good movie, it's up man. Such a good movie. He's amazing in it. He should have won an Oscar, honestly. He was incredible in, um, what was the drinking one he just did? Oh, um, I love them. I loved it. Um, it's like, what's it called? La Last No, Mads Mickelson drinking movie. Something Hour? Uh, uh, no. Let me Google it real quick. Hold yes, on, everybody. Let's Google it. Another round. Another round. It's, it's, it's great. really, really good. Really, really good. I believe he was nominated for that. I think he was in too. 20, it was yeah. in 2021, I think. All right. 
Anthony, do we have any um, haters or unsubscribes? We, we have a ton of unsubscribes because we haven't done an intermission for the last two episodes. So I have a stockpile. So <laughs> get, get ready for this. So in our uh, Robert De Niro wore uh, 90 suits for Casino, Jazzy Jeff wrote, not even triple digit suits unsubscribed. <laughs> Travis Ryan wrote in our Lord of the Rings one, we're going to have a lot more AI. Did you guys not learn from the humans versus technology episode you did? I'm out of here before I get skynetted. Unsubscribed. <laughs> it's going to be uh, AI on Thursday. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be fun. I mean, on what's on yeah, Thursday. Yeah, Thursday. Yeah. yeah. In our soups episode, FBI wrote, you have, you've got the runtime of Endgame wrong twice in one week. <laughs> in movie news, you said it was three hours, 30 minutes. Then this one, you said three hours, 10 to 15 minutes, when it's actually three hours and two minutes unsubscribed. Sorry, guys. Next up, Joshua Reiner, 308, wrote, wow, you mean to tell me you guys aren't perfect? Wow, unsubscribe. JK, love the show. And then we have, we have a real hater. I'm not going to say their name because it has a bad word in it. Um, I like your show, but I've noticed that it's pretty much 75% nar- Marvel nerd shit. Like, all you guys do is talk about Marvel. What? And then I wrote, our last several main episodes have been Prisoners, Pulp Fiction, Interstellar. And they, never, they didn't respond to that. Are they serious? I don't understand where they got that from. I mean, we do talk about Marvel nerd shit, but 75% of our content is not. I mean, we did Hogwarts Legacy, True Detective recently. Yeah, we, yeah, John yeah, I wrote, Wick. I wrote, I wrote True Detective. Scream, 65. Yeah. We did a three-hour episode of The Last Detective. of Us, Oscars, Creed 3. The last time we did a Marvel movie, we did the Bourne Trilogy. It's because it was uh, in our movie news episode, and I think that there was just a, like a lot of Marvel announcements that day. It's Marvel, man. Yeah, the was, last Marvel the movie news? we did yeah. was February 21st, was Ant-Man and the Wasp. Yeah, it, yeah, literally f- over a month ago. So, whatever, Jeez bro. Jeez Louise, man. Next up, the Rich Patrick wrote in our Dungeons and Dragons giveaway. Going to see it today. Excited. Give me the bag or I'm unsubscribed. <laughs> <laughs> Scantron wrote, Brendan Gleeson's character in Banshees of Una Sharon took unsubscribing to a whole new level. I like that one. I like that, that was a good one. That's good. <laughs> uh, Mac Wells in our D&D giveaway. Just saw it tonight and it was great. Here's hoping I win the contest so I don't have to unsubscribe. Evan Smith wrote, let's go. A better winner unsubscribed. Grayson Yonts said, you better apologize in the next episode because now I am unsubscribed. I can't remember what I have to apologize for, but I said something in the DMs. I can't remember. It's going to get canceled in and the then, DMs. Uh, no, he was kidding. And then, no, no, it was just like uh, we didn't put something in a list or something. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, this is a good one in our John Wick episode. The Kid Jor wrote, I am the unsubscriber. <laughs> <laughs> like that one. In our Hogwarts review, Luke 101 wrote, no mention of mommy, a.k.a. Professor Garlic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember I said the same thing. Unsubscribe. I said the same shit when we were playing. I'm like, Professor Garlic, man. <laughs> you said she could get it. <laughs> hey, don't say how vulgar I am on the show. <laughs> like a vulgar 16-year-old. Yeah, she could get it. <laughs> if he wears Air, Air Jordans, he could get it. Monkey's out of the barrel now. Don't go back in. <laughs> Landon Adams wrote, uh, in our studios episode, actually, Disney bought Marvel in 2009. Unsubscribe! And then Mason Kunstler wrote, if you, do, if you two don't have a happy, happy birthday, I'm going to unsubscribe. Oh, wow. Thanks. Happy, happy birthday. Happy, happy. Ren and Stimpy. Oh, I remember. And Henry, in our interview of the actors from D&D, wrote, you guys are too Hollywood for me now. I'm going to have to unsubscribe. JK, proud of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> The Phantom Bat in our Scream Queens episode wrote, So you're not going to acknowledge Arnold Schwarzenegger as a final girl? I can't believe this unsubscribed. <laughs> Robert John Leet wrote, Lynch did not direct all of the original series of Twin Peaks, but he did re- return to direct Twin Peaks on all of the newer episodes. The fact that you guys don't know that, with the Twin Peaks nerd listening, unsubscribed! Also, so far, True Detective episode is great. Thanks, pal. <laughs> Thanks, pal. <laughs> Travis Ryan in a uh, movie news episode. I need an errorless, grammatically correct, and straightforwardly boring podcast, so unsubscribe. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph uh, in our Interstellar episode wrote, Tars stole the show in this podcast with no mention of case. 
Talk about Stolen Valor. Unsubscribe. We did not mention Case Sorry, at Case. All. No one cares about Case. We didn't mention Case for a second. <laughs> That's true. Case Erasure. <laughs> I, th- I just call him the other Tars. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That was a great batch. We have a great five-star review from Jesse. This podcast brings back, brings swag back. Found this podcast back in early 2021, and I've been listening ever since. Anyone that loves movies and the artistry of films should listen to this podcast. This podcast has a grand amount of variety in episodes, which always entertains. They break down films and different aspects of the film industry in a manner that is interesting and informative. I have added many films to watch to my watch list on Letterboxd due to the suggestions Anthony and James make. These guys keep me entertained on my morning commute, long flights, or gym sessions. Love seeing some fellow Northeast natives having success. Hope these fellas keep up the good work. P.S. I am Juno's number one fan. Aw, thanks that's so sweet. much, Jesse. All right, let's do review. um. My stream recommendation is Possession. Now this is on Shutter, or you can rent it on Amazon. It came out in 1981. It is an incredibly trippy, fucked up, and brilliant horror film. About love. Wait, what was it? Possession. Oh, <laughs> I wasn't listening. <laughs> it's a great movie. It's a, well, it sounds like a good film. <laughs> <laughs> I recommended it to you, motherfucker. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> He's never even seen it. <laughs> I seen it. You're possessed with hate and jealousy. <laughs> you ripped a man's throat out with your bare hands. You must I read it. your heart <laughs> of this toxicity, Anthony. <laughs> My streaming recommendation is Master and Commander, The Far Side of the World, starring Russell Crowe, directed by Peter Weir. It's one of my favorite uh, ancient epics, not ancient, but uh, historical epics. It's on HBO Max. It is flat out just an amazing adventure film. Terrific characters, so entertaining, and it actually kind of got left by the wayside because it came out after Pirates of the Caribbean in the same year. So Pirates of the Caribbean got like all the attention for being swashbuckling and fun, high seas adventure. And then when Master and Commander came out, it was like a more serious version of that kind of film. And so it didn't get much attention, although it got a bunch of Oscar nominations. But if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It's really fantastic. It's one of Russell Crowe's best performances in his insane filmography of roles. And that's saying something. I really do think this is one of his greatest uh, achievements as an actor. And then Peter Weir is an amazing Australian director. Check out his work, but check this one out first. Truman Show, baby. Truman Show. It's a really accurate film historically, too. Absolutely. Like what life was like for sailors. It's awesome. It was not easy. It's awesome. It's not easy. They did not have Postmates. (laughs) (laughs) Or engines. (laughs) (laughs) Let's move back into our top 10 favorite films of all time. Anthony's leading us off right now with his number five selection. (laughs) I'm struggling to pick one. Okay, I got it. I got it. Should be easy, man. Speaking <laughs> of Russell Crowe, Gladiator. Let's go. Gladiator is one of my favorite movies of all time. I don't care what anybody says. It's fucking amazing. It's one of the best fucking just movies in general, but in, in terms of historical epics, ancient epics, whatever, it's the best. It's 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 so good. Hans Zimmer, Russell Crowe, Ridley Scott is one of the greatest directors of all time. Joaquin Phoenix. It is a fucking staggering achievement of filmmaking, of production, of acting. It shouldn't work, but it does. It really is lightning striking. Uh, it, the success of Gladiator, winning Best Picture, Best Actor, uh, a bunch of other accolades, while also being a huge box office hit, it catapulted Hollywood into this direction of, let's do war uh, historical epics, let's do ancient epics. Some of them were pretty good, and Gladiator still stands atop the mountain of contemporary ancient epics, and there's nothing that even comes close to it. There are films in the past that are come close to it, like Spartacus by Stanley Kubrick, and then Ben-Hur, and Ten Commandments is also awesome as well. But for ancient epics, this is the one I always revisit, and it never gets boring. I know it line by line, scene by scene, second by second, and still, I whatever I put it on, I'm just absolutely juiced the whole time. So, damn. And- good no matter how many times i've seen it it still makes me cry at the end to this day and i think maximus is one of the greatest characters ever put on screen i love him this on my list too so i'm gonna hold my tongue for now (laughs) you keep doing these spoilers like you're telling us what everyone knows this is the third time you said something's on your list everyone knows though everyone knows (laughs) just save it but everyone knows (laughs) 
everyone knows I love Gladiator. I have freaking Maximus helmet right here. Like, <laughs> like come on. Of course, Gladiator's on my list. <laughs> but my number five is a horror film, The Shining, from Stanley Kubrick. I think it's probably the best horror film of all time. Stanley Kubrick is really this master of creating this an atmosphere of his own intention like no other in suspense and what he did with The Shining and I think the decisions he made in terms of changing things from the book worked so well cinematically you know changing from the mallet to the axe as well as possibly eliminating the supernatural elements of the story and could this just be in these people's minds just stir crazy cabin fever going insane as a family together I love that and I know it pisses people off but I go with the opinion that there's no supernatural in The Shining. It's just so well made, too. The sets, cinematography, using the steady cam, going down the hallways. Incredible third act. The music is terrifying, and you can feel it crawling up your skin as it's being played in the background when shit starts to really go down. The secret messages in this film are all over the goddamn place. And I think Stanley Kubrick just likes to mess with people because his, his IQ is so high. He's like 160s IQ. And I think he just wants to mess with people at the same time as while they're watching, they're seeing things they don't understand and maybe making connections that aren't true, whether it's the the metaphor of the moon landing, then did Stanley Kubrick film the moon landing? Is that why Danny's wearing the Apollo shirt, the space shuttle shirt? Did he fake the moon landing? Is that why he changed the the room number to 237? Because the moon on average is about 237,000 miles from Earth on a day-to-day basis. All these things, like as well as the indigenous people's metaphors and, and messages he has in the film as well. The connections to America taking over, taking land from cultures. That's all over this film too. And also, I just love the balls of Stanley Kubrick to take this incredible best-selling book from one of the most acclaimed horror writers of all time at this time, so well known, and just being like, yeah, I'm going to do something different with it, and I don't care what you think, and I don't care what the studios think, because I'm Stanley Kubrick, I'm one of the greatest filmmakers to ever live, and I'm going to do whatever I want. I do what I want. <laughs> I think it's just, <laughs> it's just one of those movies that, it's a most watched movie for me, like probably top three, top four all time, most watched film in my life. I could watch it back to back nights for weeks, and I always see something new every time I watch it. And I always love picking up on things that I've read about on the internet that I never noticed before in the movie or even that great documentary, Room 237, even though some of it's not true or whatever you think. I think it's so fun to pick this movie apart. And people are still, to this day, 40 years later, 44 years later, still talking about The Shining, analyzing The Shining, picking it apart. It's one of the most famous movies of all time. And it's one of my favorites. I was enthralled. Wow. (laughs) How about that? That was great. <laughs> it's one. It's one of my most watched too. I've probably seen it upwards of twenty five times. It's great. <laughs> it's, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. <laughs> it's pretty good. <laughs> Next up at number four. Okay, we're getting into the deep tracks, man. Oh, Here we go. Oh my god. I have to go with The Godfather. What Francis Ford Coppola did with cinema in that film. And Gordon Willis with the cinematography. But then the cast is fucking ridiculous. Uh, Marlon Brando doing his thing. And then, I mean, just you get Bobby Duvall, you get James Caan, Pacino, Diane Keaton. It's really remarkable. And I've said remarkable a lot in this episode. <laughs> That's my word. <laughs> <laughs> and <clears throat> as I get older and the more times I watch it, the more I really adore it. And I've always loved it. I don't think that I loved it as much as I should have. Initially, when I started watching it as a teenager, I think it just like was all hype for me, and I was like, "Oh, it's just like an Italian mobster movie." I'm not. I didn't really understand the gravity of the filmmaking and the power of the storytelling. And then, as an adult and having watched it many times now and grown older, I really have grown to adore it so much and think that is a, it's a representation of uh, the greatest achievements of filmmaking possible, uh, and it's a timeless classic that will never be ever be replicated again nothing like that movie will ever be made again and i do prefer it over godfather 2 even though you get bobby de niro in number two i love how you're on first name basis with these actors man and they're my guys (laughs) (laughs) 
So what Francis did in <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Can <laughs> We call Marlon Marmar. <laughs> we call him Marmalade. Mar- Marmalade. <laughs> uh but the reason why I like uh, number one better is it's it shows uh the true transformation of uh Michael Corleone from the scene the first scene of him into the final scene where it's an amazing character arc, and one, I think one of the greatest character arcs, if not the greatest put on film, of an arc and transformation of a person ever put on film. And whereas number two, not so much of a transformation, he does have a sort of a downfall and becomes, he does transform some somewhat, but it's not even close to as drastic as Michael in the first film. So that's why I prefer it. I, th- I think ultimately it's a stronger story. Although, I mean, I think The Godfather Part 2 is, like, in my top 20, honestly. So it's hard. Like, just because I don't have it on my list doesn't mean I don't think number two is one of the greatest ever. But um, I think it's just a, a, a incredible piece of filmmaking. And I will always adore it to the time I die. I think it's the best movie of all time, if not the second best movie, like, behind 2001 Space Odyssey. I think, it's, for me, it's those two of the greatest films ever made. Godfather is in my top 15, but I didn't put it in my top 10. I wanted to, you know, mix things. I want to have other films in there. You know, I didn't want to do... I could have put them in there, you know, because The Godfather is so well made. The highest form of art for cinema. It really is. And it, it insists upon itself. <laughs> have you ever seen that that Family Guy bit? No. Where Peter's like, I don't like The Godfather. And then everyone's like, why? What, what do you mean? And Lois like, it's like the perfect movie. Like, what are you talking about? He's like... Not for me. Not for me. Yeah. <laughs> and everyone's like grilling him. Like, what do you mean you don't like it? Even like, even the kids are like, why don't you like it? And Brian like, what, what, it's the best movie of, of all time. He's like, it insists upon itself. They're like, what does that even mean? He's like, I don't know, but it, it insists upon itself. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> no, it's it's either the great, it's one, it's the best movie of all time or the second best movie of all time. I've been in no comp. It's just it's facts, facts, facts of it's the science. Day. Great pick. It is science. <laughs> <laughs> My number four is a horror film <gasps> set in space nice alien i fucking love alien so so much i love the characters i love the setup and i love the concept the creature designs of the xenomorph of the face huggers everything it's the it was the craziest movie i've ever seen i think when i was first time i saw it as a kid yeah we were young and it still sticks with me. I watch it every year. It's one of those movies I have to watch every year. I think Ridley Scott is such an incredible director. And everyone always says he's out of his prime. But no, this guy's not out of his prime. Like, wait till you see Napoleon. Go watch The Last Duel. The movies are incredible. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Alien really just, like, he changed the game of science fiction. Obviously, with Blade Runner, but obviously in, with Alien. And I feel like everyone's been trying to capture this movie in the science fiction horror genre ever since it came out. It created a genre. It really yeah. did. And everyone wishes like they could have made <laughs> Alien. Like Alien's like a fucking a perfect horror Only movie. Only really science fiction it, movie. And what he did was so special. This movie, everything about it just has created this this like lore and canon to it that's really rich with detail and obviously they're gonna be making so many spin offs and movies and shows off it'll of it never end the next couple of years. But all from this one movie which is really special. And, and, you know, there are other franchises that have done that. But when it, this is just one of the best movies ever made. So creepy, so terrifying. Great log line, tagline, no one, in space no one can hear you scream. Great third act. Ripley is such an incredible character. I just love this movie so, so much. I can watch it endlessly, man. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I don't know how many times I've seen this movie. It's a lot. It's one of my most watched movies in... I never get tired of it, and I just love the hell out of it. It's so it's so perfect. It really is. And you look back, and I mean, I, I so I believe so fully that movies from the past are becoming underrated and less less seen, less seen uh, as, as the years go on. Where I think less people want to revisit older movies. They're like monuments that people don't go to look at anymore. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think it's a shame because this really is. Um, it it created the subgenre of sci-fi horror. I mean, it, that had been done a thousand times. Monster movies, alien monster sci-fi movies, have been d- happening for decades in the '40s and '50s, and obviously, but like this is like the god. This is the Godfather, Apex Mountain of the genre, and nothing comes close. I can't think of a sci-fi horror film 
that even is in the same ballpark as Alien. Outside of Aliens, obviously. But I mean, I wouldn't even. That's a action sci-fi horror movie. Yeah. I, I mean, it's kind of sci-fi. Yeah, sure, There's but plenty of horror to call it. But horror. outside of the the genre, the but you wouldn't fran- call it a horror outside movie. of the franchise. Yeah. Outside yeah. of Aliens and Alien, nothing comes close. Nothing. 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 But yeah, I love it. At my number three, oh, we're in it's, it's pretty deep territory. I have my first movie with Martin Scorsese. Goodfellas. I find it to be so rewatchable, so entertaining. Uh, we just had it on a couple of weeks ago. And I was just like, I watched most of it, and I had to like, I was like editing, and I just would just come into the house and just sit down and watch like twenty minutes here and there because someone else was watching it. And this movie is really fantastic, and it's very important to me as a, a film lover. And the more times I've seen it, the more I've loved cinema because of it. Like it's a movie that really help define my love of movies. You know what I mean? That's how important it is to me. And it's I think it's one of the most impressive feats of directing because um, there are so many scenes in this movie. There are so many scenes. There are so many locations. There's it's so- three movies. Yeah, it's crazy. It's 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 Henry as a kid, then Henry as an adult, then Henry's fall. Yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. The sheer scope of the film and how Marty pulled it off. Uh, the cast is amazing, iconic, legendary. Um, but Scorsese as a director, I think, is the the greatest film director of all time. This is an example of it. And it wasn't that well regarded. I mean, people liked it when it came out. Um, Pesci won his Oscar. But in terms of awards, that's basically all it got. And now it's looked back, looked back upon as one of the greatest films of all time. But I think it was uh, ahead of its time, and people didn't really understand what it was. And now we do, obviously. But it's just all forms of cinema. You... It has some of the one of the greatest edited movies of all time too. The editing is phenomenal, and really makes the movie work in a lot of ways. Uh, his also his song selections are the greatest ever. I think I think that Goodfellas has the greatest soundtrack of all time, and Scorsese was one of the early American directors to start putting popular music into his films. In the '60s, Cassavetes was doing it earlier and got him into it. Uh, it since. Goodfellas, I mean, there are directors who are just defined by using soundtracks, you know what I mean? And they all are trying to do their Goodfellas, you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. So, I mean, Edgar Wright, James Gunner in that category. Yeah. Um, it's just a phenomenal movie. It's it's just I get so much joy when I watch it. I really do. Same. It might be the most watched movie of my life. It probably is. I adore everything about Goodfellas. Could quote it forever. Love it, love it, love it. The characters, Jimmy Conway, Tommy DeVito, Henry Hill, iconic trio, great actors. Scorsese, man. We also did a great episode of it. Yeah. (laughs) It's fucking Goodfellas. I've had the privilege of showing Goodfellas to people for their first time. Multiple people have shown it to them at their first viewing, and they both of them put it in their top ten all time. After the movie was over, they're like, that's one of the best movies I've ever seen in my life. That's automatically top ten movie in my lifetime. That's how good it is. My number three is The Godfather Part 2. Nice. I adore The Godfather so much. Why do you hate The Godfather? But I love The Godfather Part 2, and I have it, I have it more higher for my favorite movies because I just love the sequences of Vito, played by Robert De Niro, in his youth, coming over from Italy Origins. to New York, then establishing himself as the Don in his neighborhood what that looked like. This incredible flashback while cross-cutting with Michael, present day, building the Corleone family into an empire, but also risking everything and beginning his downfall of losing everything. Everything that he loves, everything that's close to him. Obviously, his brother, his wife, his family. Towards the end of the film, then the third the third film, obviously. And I think that's some of the best acting I've ever seen in my entire life, specifically Pacino. The nonverbal acting in Godfather Part Two is on a different level, different different actor. You know, people aren't like this guy. I mean, he expresses so much without saying a single word, just the look in his eyes when he sends Kay on her way out of the family for good, out of that kitchen door. The emotions and the things he's saying in just his eyes, incredible. And when the senators try to cross him, the looks he gives them, it's just he's saying so much. And obviously Pacino in, in Godfather is such an underrated performance as well. But I think Godfather Part Two, just for the flashbacks, 
of, you know, tons of Italian being spoken, what it was like in Little Italy and New York in the early 20th century, just seeing Vito rise up. Awesome. Loved it. I, I, could, I feel like I could live there. And it's just like this movie, those sequences just feel like a memory that you're living someone else's life for a time. And I just love it so much. Great pick. Great pick. I mean, yeah, I mean, Pacino, he didn't win either of those movies. It's because he was with De Niro, <laughs> acting with De Niro and Marlon Brando. <laughs> but, like, he could easily have two extra Oscars to his belt, you know what I mean, because of those movies. It's true. It's true. E vero. Next up. That means it's true in Italian. I have a big one. A timeless, <laughs> a timeless one. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's my most used GIF, I think, is the South Park detective who goes, nice. nice. <laughs> Cause it's I don't know, you've been using Officer Doofy a lot. Officer Doofy saluting is actually my new go-to. <laughs> You're right. Officer Doofy reporting for duty. <laughs> I told you not to disturb me when I'm cleaning my room. <laughs> <laughs> I shit my pants. <laughs> Gail swallows. What's, the, what's, the, what's that smell? It smells terrible. It smells like shit. Yeah, I pooped my pants. Gail swallows. <laughs> oh my god! Said they fun for you. <laughs> Just throws it off her face. <laughs> I said, never disturb me when I'm cleaning my room. <laughs> oh, my God. Scream is so underrated. I mean, scary, scary movie. movie's so underrated. Oh, my God. Uh, oh, my God. That movie's so funny. <laughs> Anyways, I chose my number two movie, Jaws, Spielberg's uh, classic. I think it's the best directed movie ever. I do. Th I've been. I, I think so. I've seen it so many times. Did you times. say that about Silence of the Lambs? I said it's one of, oh, okay. and I said the scene with Clarice and Hannibal is the, the best. best directed gotcha. scene, motherfucker. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when I watched this movie over and over again over the last couple of decades, wait, no, I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> Ever since I it was growing up in the seventies, <laughs> when I saw it in theaters, <laughs> blew my mind. When I was twelve, when I was two, <laughs> I was like, "This is cinema." <laughs> but um, what Spielberg did at such a young age is fucking insane. But when you watch Jaws, and I, I tell people Jaws is one of my favorite movies of all time, and oftentimes I get reactions of like people like, "Really, Jaws?" or or, or like they'll laugh and or they'll scoff at it. Maybe they haven't even seen it. They just think it's like the big shark horror movie, or they've seen it maybe once and they didn't really like fully get it. But when you watch the when you watch the film enough times, and you see how Spielberg is moving his camera, how he's directing his actors, how he's blocking the scenes out, how he's editing, how he's framing everything, the sequences he's putting together, it's just truly perfection as a filmmaker. And the more times I see it, the more I'm just like. Is there anything that can be better than this? Is there anything that's ever been done like better than this? And can anything be edited better? Can it be directed better? No. Every decision he makes is just like truly the best decision for the movie. And then the the acting, obviously, I mean, we did a whole episode on it, is so iconic and legendary. Uh, the the shark worked perfectly for the film, but obviously imperfectly for the production. Uh, and to be 26 years old and make that movie is just truly insane to me. And he's had such an uh, incredible career, one of the greatest of all time. Uh, but still, even though I love all of his movies, I keep going back to Jaws. It's my most watched movies of his. It's one of my most watched movies of all time. And I just fucking love that movie. It's so goddamn good. And I can put it on any time of the day. I completely agree with everything you said. Thanks, man. To think that 26 years old, this production was so doomed, too. I mean, it shouldn't work. Let's put this big mechanical shark in the fucking ocean and make a movie with it. And it ends up being one of the best movies of all time. And it didn't work on set in the over overshooting, the delays, over budget. 
and then creating such a phenomenon, changing cinema forever. You've changed things at, forever. forever. <laughs> at 26, he changed movies forever, creating the first summer blockbuster. Made people terrified to go into the ocean for years still. Jaws is Jaws, man. You said everything. Really what else stuff. can be said? What else can be said? All right. My turn to do number two. <laughs> well, I was expecting that. <laughs> I'm letting anyone, everyone listening know. It's my turn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, what to choose at number two for my all-time favorite movies. Everyone probably can already guess what my top two are. I don't know. <laughs> well, the, the it two be anything. <laughs> I guess you weren't paying attention this whole episode, man. <laughs> oh, you know, I, I know something's going to be in there with uh that I've said already. My name is Maximus Decimus Meridius. Gladiator, number two on my list all time. Like Anthony said, I fucking love this movie. <laughs> I don't care what anyone says. Fucking one of the best movies ever made. Incomparable. Best ancient ancient story of all time for film. Hasn't even been touched. Hasn't even <laughs> fucking touched. No one can come close to Gladiator. Even Ridley won't be able to with Gladiator 2. Nope. You can't even come close to this movie. It shouldn't work. Freaking 22-page script making one of the greatest <laughs> movies of all time. How the fuck does that happen? <laughs> Ridley fucking Scott, that's why. And Russell Crowe. And just incredible dynamic that they created with this film. Maximus Decimus Meridius, my all-time favorite film character. Got the helmet right here. Got it in Scotland. Look at this goddamn thing. I love the story so much. Hans Zimmer's music is sensational. I think it's his, if not his best score or second best, like behind Interstellar. It's up there, man. It's really special it's what he there. did. It's like similar to Dune, you know, using with with Dune they created alien instruments, but with Gladiator they had to create ancient instruments that used to exist that no one knows about anymore. They aren't they don't exist anymore. Just basically kind of creating these flutes, the duduk, stuff like that. These ancient notes and music, but how accurate it is to what ancient Rome really was like. You know, it wasn't like Italy today. It was so similar to what a Middle, Middle Eastern country was like. And so just getting that accurate as hell as well as the gladiators themselves, the slaves coming from every part of the earth, every culture, every kind of person was a slave in ancient Rome. It's very accurate, I think, historically. A lot of it. Obviously, you know, Commodus didn't really fight in the arena like he did against Maximus, who didn't technically exist. There was a gladiator named Maximus. But I think the story of this general who loses everything after he's given given the entire empire, loses everything in his life, and another revenge movie on my list, fighting until his dying breath, destroy the person who took everything away from him. Great pick. Hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Spaniard, Spaniard, Spaniard. Do you think is really Scott one of your favorite directors for sure? Oh, absolutely. Like, is he, where is he ranked? I mean, you have top two. Of, you have two of his movies in your top, top ten for sure. Movies. Top ten for sure. I'd have to think about top five, but I mean, I freaking love that guy's movies, man. Yeah. I like a lot of his movies. I really do. It's a cool, dude. I mean, Blade Runner too, dude. Yeah, man. Blade Runner is incredible. Yeah, he's awesome. I love that guy. Hey, the Martian's incredible. Oh, yeah. He's one of the best directors ever. I don't care what anyone says. And he's not out of his prime. <laughs> Fuck you. He's it all the time on prime. film Twitter, man. Film Twitter is the really? worst. They just, I, I People bet, talk I, shit well, about... I, I mean, I bet they just don't even watch many of his movies. They just, I don't think they do. I don't think they're aware of all, all the films he's done. I see it quite a lot on film Twitter. Uh -huh. Obviously, lots of terrible takes on there, but people... It's common to... To berate Ridley Scott and saying he's like this old man. How do they keep giving him budgets to make movies? We should give it to New they Blood. Keep making money. He's making great fucking movies. Yeah, he's Ridley Scott. He just made us. The Martian made six hundred million dollars. Of course they're gonna keep giving him money. <laughs> he's awesome. He makes great movies. Obviously not every film in his career is epic. I think that um, there's like a recency bias towards him because obviously people didn't love Prometheus and Alien Covenant. I think Prometheus is awesome. Yeah, but I mean, I think people judge him based on those movies, and he has had a couple of misses, but I mean, he's still, I mean, he's still one of the greatest directors of all time still working today. I mean, The Last Duel is one of the best films of the last 10 years, I would say. Um, it's, it's a really sensational film, and then I can't wait for Napoleon. I think he's going to do something really special, but I, I love the guy. He's, he's in my top 10. Absolutely. I mean, the guy made Gladiator, Alien, and Blade Runner. What the fuck? Are you serious? It's insane. Insane. 
Like, what the hell? It's, it's unbelievable. All in it's different decades. To, it's hard to believe. It's hard to believe. It really is. He's one of those filmmakers that every decade has made a movie that could be considered the best movie of that decade. Scorsese's mm-hmm. done that, too. Yeah. Well, I mean, Stanley Kubrick is the only... So, with Stanley Kubrick, what sets him apart is that he's made a movie in, like, every... Jo- in all the genres he made a movie, It's consider- it could argue that it's the greatest movie of that genre. So... Uh, you take ancient epics, Spartacus, you could argue is the greatest ancient epic movie ever made. And then 2001, you could argue is the greatest science fiction movie ever made. Clockwork Orange, you could argue is the greatest dystopian era movie ever made. The Shining, you could argue is the greatest horror movie ever made. Full Metal Jacket. Full Metal Jacket, you could argue is the greatest war film ever made. Um... Sorry, off the top. Barry Lyndon. Barry Lyndon, you could argue, is, one of the, is the greatest costume drama ever made. And so, I mean... Dr. Strangelove. Dr. Strangelove, you you could argue, is the greatest war film ever made as well. That's another one. Um, But it's it's insane. The guy's career, there's nothing like it. And Like, what other filmmaker can you say that about? It's tough. I mean, if if Nolan made a horror movie... You could kind of have that conversation. He's because Dunkirk's a masterpiece. Interstellar is one of the best science fiction films of all time. I think if if you're coming to like mysteries, Memento or The Prestige are some of the greatest in that category. Memento is an incredible mystery. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. But I mean, to to go genre to genre, and then Eyes Wide Shut, you could argue is the greatest sexual thriller movie ever made. You're getting pretty specific with your genres now. Hey, it's, a, <laughs> it's a big genre. There's a lot of movies in that genre. I'm just saying, like. It's ridiculous, all those genres. Yeah, he's, he's, and to be to make a movie in each of them that you, you could argue is the best movie in that genre, it's incredible. Over and over again, it's crazy. How about we get to Anyways, your number one? My number one. I've talked about it, or raved about it so many times in the podcast. I'm sure nobody's going to be surprised when I say "There Will Be Blood" by Paul Thomas Anderson. It's the film that made me really fall in love with cinema. I've seen it so many times to this day. I love every bit of it. Um, when I watch it, I feel transformed. When I watch it. I am just transfixed on the screen. I'm transfixed on Danny Day-Lewis, which is, I would say, his performance as Danny Plainview is the greatest of all time of performances. Uh, the score by Johnny Greenwood. Cinematography, location, setting. Uh, what it is about, about an oil tycoon and his rise to power. Like, w- no other movies really depicted that before. Uh, the period piece setting, Paul Dano in a great early debut of his, uh, holding doing his best to hold his own against Danny Day-Lewis, which I'm sure was a huge challenge. Um, but when I watch Paul Thomas Anderson movies, I'm just always just in love with them. He he taps into uh, into my like heart and how I feel about art in such a powerful way that it doesn't matter any of his movies. I just I can put them on any time of the day. And if I I have a bunch of his movies in my top 100, 100 favorite movies, you know what I mean? But the, There Will Be Blood is uh, really important to me. It always has been, and I'll I'll watch it. I watch it annually, and I always will watch it annually, and try to watch it on a big screen with a l- loud music, loud volume as much as I can. But for me, There Will Be Blood is like my rebirth as a lover of movies into really loving cinema in a profound way. Yeah, Anthony. Whenever he watches this annually, he he sits about four inches away from the screen. <laughs> the speakers at his ears. Oh, uh, I thought it was gonna be funnier than that. <laughs> that wasn't that funny. <laughs> that was pretty lame. No, no right, right, right. Here <laughs> I thought we go. you were gonna say like jerking off or something. Whenever Anthony watches, there will be blood. He covers himself in oil. See, that's better. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> Doesn't work as well the second attempt though. Yeah. But it would have been better. First you attempt. failed flat. You that was a terrible joke. I'm sorry. I have to call you out. Whoa, man. <laughs> Whoa, getting a little aggressive. You sound like Daniel Plainview, your hero. <laughs> I told you I would eat you. I told you I would eat you up. I hate people <laughs> i agree it's i think it's the best acting performance of all time as well this movie when you watch it it's it's just something different you know it's transcends cinema in a way and i think daniel plainview this character so fascinating electric on screen you can't take your eyes off Daniel day lewis whenever he's in a movie but i think this specifically i i feel like i've never seen anyone in, in so control of embodying another human being than him is Daniel Plainview. And it's just, when you watch it, it's just, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like this performance, this intense two-hour character study about this wild, wild guy. 
He's a, wild, he's a wild guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I was, I was going. I was doing he's well. He's out too. of adjectives. I was doing well. He's out of adjectives. It's been an hour and a half, man. Sometimes when you talk for this long, wild and crazy. Wild stallion. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, he actually is wild in a way, like untamed, uncivilized. At it, yeah, he is wild. Yeah, yeah. He kills somebody. Yeah, <laughs> he kills two people. Yeah, he kills a couple. Yeah, yeah he kills a guy with a bowling pin. <laughs> I mean, it's fucking awesome. <laughs> I'm finished. I'm finished. All right, Jim. It's up to you. What's your final movie on this list? What's your favorite movie? Of all time. Surprisingly, it's not going to be Dune, everybody. I hate to burst your bubbles. Oh, yeah, I wasn't expecting Dune. It's too early. No, it's a joke. Yeah. Oh. People expect that. <laughs> Another <laughs> joke that landed. <laughs> people, no, it's just a joke that people have make about me. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, get, yeah. I'm, go, I'm accepting the joke. Uh-huh. Because people know I like Dune a lot. <laughs> My favorite movie of all time is The Matrix. And... Got, we have two posters, but I have one in my room. And, and this movie is, it was kind of like a life-changing movie for me. I remember the experience as well. Jamie took us when we were kids. Had no idea what the fuck it was about. But I remember I was just so curious about it. And we obviously rented it at Blockbuster multiple times over the years. And every time I watch it, it's hard to explain like what I feel because I feel so transported into this story that, like you said earlier, it shouldn't work. It should not make sense at all. But what the Wachowskis did with great influences from other films, anime, like Ghost in the Shell, is craft this unbelievable story with these incredible characters of something that people couldn't even comprehend at the time. But while they were watching it, they knew it was special and they knew it was different and they still loved it. And then it's one of those movies that for some people you need to watch it twice to really appreciate it. And some people think there's a knock to that, but I think there's definitely a, a major pro to that. I think, oh, yeah, if you watch movies over and over again, you get something better out of it every time, and they get better and better each time. The Matrix, I've seen, I don't know, like 30 goddamn times. I know it so well. It's just so unique, or it was so unique. Obviously not anymore. And it just taps into so many different things, whether it's philosophical, about existence, reality, being special, and then obviously the prophet like figure with Neo, the one, the Messiah, so many religious undertones as well. The great sci fi achievements in technology that they developed for the filmmaking, the action sequences bringing martial arts and kung fu into computer generated war. It's fucking crazy cool. And they changed so many genres at, at once. They changed the action genre, they changed the sci fi genre. They changed filmmaking forever with this movie. They changed animation and CGI forever. And everyone, when they saw this movie, if you were a filmmaker at the time or a studio, you're like, fuck. That's what we have to compete with? <laughs> we have to compete with this fucking movie in 1999? And everyone's like, we don't have anything like that. <laughs> I can only imagine that's what studios are probably thinking. Like, how the hell are we going to make anything like this? Yeah. And, you know, I think it's such an important movie to every genre of, of movies. And, and Keanu's perfectly cast. And... Lawrence Fishburne, Carrie Ann Moss, Hugo Weaving. It's it's such an incredible movie. The music and just this like it feels like a mythology that once existed, but it doesn't. Like an ancient mythology, but it's our present day. But it also it's just all computer generated reality. This is what it all it's all taking place in this impossible space. It's so fascinating. It's wild. And then the the backdrop of the war of humanity has been decimated and destroyed by AI, artificial tech, artificial intelligence and technology and living underground it's it's so fascinating there's so many layers to it and i love it i love it so much yeah i mean and i really love the john wick movies but i mean for keanu like the matrix it's they they don't even come close to the matrix in my opinion well there'd be no john wick even without yeah. the matrix because it, him and chad yeah. Zahelsky. and obviously they're very different movies but like i hope that younger people if they haven't seen the matrix they give it a chance and see how remarkable of a film that is and how how really i mean Life-changing it was for a lot of us when we were young watching that movie, and it really um, stood apart from anything else. Like, nothing was like it. Sensational piece of work. Um, yeah, it, it's it's just, and it's also a testament to how great it is for us to both put in our top ten list. I think it's both in our top fives. Would you have it six or five? I had it at um six. Yeah, at six. Close. Yeah. I had to put Gladiator ahead of it. 
I fucking love Gladiator. Are you not entertained? <laughs> that almost was number one for me, honestly. But I still, I knew, I, I, I knew you were gonna put Matrix. Yeah, I've had yeah. the Matrix at number one for like three years now. Yeah, I, m- I remember you've been saying that a lot lately. Well, that wraps our top ten lists. Wow, that's some pretty good lists. That I was, like your list, man. I, I like your list too. It was a lot of fun. Thanks. I was worried they'd be too similar. I wasn't worried. I think well, we did, I, yeah, I didn't care. I think we did a good job. Yeah. Though. I mean, there's only a couple of um, crossovers with God with um, Matrix and Gladiator. Matrix Gladiator. That was it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, because you did Departed for Marty, Alien for Ridley. Yeah. I didn't have a Fincher movie on here, man. That was tough to do. I had to put Seven on. I think that was the toughest thing for me is to not have a Fincher movie on here because Fincher's a top five director for, for me for a favorite director. And also the way I judged this list mostly was the movies I've watched the most. Yeah, kind of for me too. Like these are like my most watched movies, all of them. Um, And then like some close ones for most watched, obviously um, Predator – Taxi Driver. Predator almost made my list yeah. too, man. I love Predator. Uh, I don't... I, it was so tough to not put a Lord of the Rings movie on this list I almost... Too, I, I had Lord of the Rings Fellowship of the Ring at 11. And then it was I was so like, tough, I was man. like, I have to cut one of these, so I'm cutting... Like, I was like, if I had to choose between watching any of these 11 movies, um, what's the one I would be least likely to put on? And it, out of these 10, out of these, those 11, I was like, I guess Lord of the Rings I would put on last. Some some of the others I left on the floor, obviously, Fight Club, Lord of the Rings, Fellowship specifically. Chinatown I left out on the floor. Last Samurai almost made it too. Yeah, I almost put Last Samurai on it too because it's like, this isn't what I think are the best films ever made. It's really what are my most watched and most loved movies. And that's is, there's a big difference between that. Donnie Darko almost made my list. Oh, that's yeah, that's a good one. Pan's Labyrinth almost made my list. Uh, Anchorman was on the floor too so like i think we did a pretty good job of staying true to like just our favorites yeah i mean i almost put blade runner on i was very close it just barely made it barely got cut so yeah there's so many great films that i mean we've talked about so many times and, and i didn't i didn't even put a tarantino movie on my list I yeah didn't, i yeah. didn't put a nolan movie on my list I noticed that i was like uh but the thing is like nolan like there'd be six nolan movies in my top 50 you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and top five favorite directors yeah, i'm sure yeah. he's there yeah so i mean it's like the top 10 it's a tough list to really condense all of the movies you've seen. And staying true to yourself. Yeah. Without not... trying to, like, impress anybody yeah. or put movies that you think are supposed to be there. Yeah. So that's why, like, I mean, I had to put The Thing. Because I love, I fucking love The Thing. I had to put it on. Motherfucker looks like, like The, the thing. thing. I had to. Reservoir Dogs reference. I had to. And I had to put Silence of the Lambs on. I really did. Man, I, I just love all these movies here so much. So, 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 so much. Well, that was a blast. If you feel like sending us your top 10 list, yeah. definitely tweet it at us. Send it to us on Instagram DMs. We'll share it or something. And we'd love yeah, to see I'd, what I'd you like put. Yeah. We'd love to see what you put on your top 10 list, your favorite films. Again, favorite films, not the greatest films in your opinion. Just your 10 favorite movies of all time. We'd love to see that. Thanks so much for tuning in. Become a patron today. It's the best way to support the show. We appreciate you all so much. Now take care. See you next time. This episode was executive produced by our Chosen One patrons, Cody Moen, Andrew Hagen, Becca Keen, Benjamin Cook, Calvin Murphy Griggs, Nicholas Martin, Darian, Tyler McFly, and Sal Koching. Our Chosen One patrons are our biggest supporters. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, hit the like button as well, notifications for sure. Listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, everywhere you can listen to podcasts. And be sure to check out this other content we have on our YouTube channel.